This memory was from when I was a child and I went camping in the woods with my parents and two older brothers. I've never been much of a camper. Fishing, hiking, making a fire, I find it all boring, so I mostly just sat under a tree the whole time and read a book. The first day passed by really quickly since I was so into my book and before I knew it, it was time to get into our sleeping bags and turn in for the night. Even now as an adult, I have a hard time falling asleep, but it was worse back then. My mind was going a million miles a minute. I was lying there in my own little world, thinking about my book, when something flashed in my peripheral vision and captured my attention. Sitting up, I spotted a boy, about my size, standing by a tree at the edge of the campsite. He had curly blonde hair and intense green eyes. His clothing was simple, sort of like a short robe, but thinking about it now, it didn't seem to be made of cloth. It was almost like giant, thin leaves had been stitched together. The boy then motioned for me to come closer, and being a small, curious child, I decided to see what he wanted. My mom always said that I had no common sense, and I can't disagree, since I followed the boy into the woods without question trying to stay close as the trees became denser and the branches scratched at my arms. But as we moved deeper into the woods, I started to get a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. I thought about turning around and going back to the camp, but then he suddenly stopped. He walked over to a nearby tree, which had a large gaping hollow, and pulled something out of it. It was a small round cake with blue icing about the size of my palm. The boy didn't say anything. He just held the cake out to me, motioning for me to take it. I didn't know what to do. I knew it was rude to refuse something given to you, but the look in his eyes gave me the chills. I took a step back and bumped into something. I spun around and found another boy standing there, and he wasn't the only one. I could see now that I was completely surrounded by boys and girls of different heights, but all with blonde hair and green eyes. They started to close in on me, and the one holding the cake came forward once again and held it out to me. I took it from him. His hands were ice cold and stared at it. It was a nice looking cake with blue icing. I was a bit hungry from walking in the woods to get there, but it still didn't sit right with me. I knew that I had to think quickly, so I threw the cake as hard as I could behind the boy, and he and the others lunged for it, trying to catch it so that it wouldn't hit the ground. I took off at the same time in the direction I'd come from. At least, I thought it was the direction I'd come from. As I ran, I heard weird noises coming from the woods all around me. Some sounded like animals growling and hissing, while others were voices that repeated a few words over and over again. Don't go. Mine. Stay. I was crying badly as I ran, only stopping when I couldn't breathe anymore and had to gasp for air. I leaned against an old wooden log and hugged my knees. The forest was quiet now, and I had no clue as to where I was. I cried for what seemed like hours before I felt myself drifting off to sleep. Before the dream world took me completely, I heard words I didn't understand whispered in my ear. Erinschlacht. When I woke up, I was back in my sleeping bag with my family all around me. They were still sleeping comfortably, and I started to believe that it was all a bad dream. That is, until I looked down at my hands. On my fingers, bits of blue icing stained my skin and shimmered in the light of the sunrise. Not even thinking, I licked the icing off. Then I heard giggling from the woods behind me. I turned around but found nothing there. Years later, I looked up the words that were whispered to me that night, which I will never forget. 
Aaron Schlocht and found that they mean Ireland descended or Irish descent. I've looked into my bloodline and found that I am part Irish and also Scottish, Greek, two tribes of Cherokee, Blackfoot, and many others. I even have Wiccan ancestors on my mom's side. I think that maybe all the weird things that have happened to me, including this incident, have something to do with my bloodline, but I can't figure out what. I think that those children I met that night might have been the fairies of the woods. I know that some mythos say that eating the food of the fair folk gives them rights over you, and you would belong in their world from then on. So what did licking that icing do to me? I've had many other strange incidents happen to me since that night, but that was the first one. The one that opened the door, in a way. The question is why? Why do strange things keep happening to me? What did those children want from me that night in the woods? And where is it all leading? I have a feeling it isn't anywhere good. At age eight, my best friend and I were in the countryside for a family barbecue. The two of us decided to go play in the large forest behind the house, just as the sun was setting. As we walked into the forest, I remember hearing what sounded like wind chimes and the sound of giggling very faintly, but at the time I didn't think much of it. We had wandered maybe three minutes into the woods, close enough so that we could still hear the sounds of the family barbecue when we came across a ring of mushrooms. I had heard that these were related to fairies in some way, and since my friend and I were both very imaginative and loved the idea of fairies, we decided to dance around inside the circle for a couple of minutes. When nothing seemed to happen, we left the circle to continue exploring. But the second we stepped out of the circle, everything changed. It had been sunset when we walked into the circle, and now suddenly it was dark, like it was the middle of the night all of a sudden. We heard people shouting our names. We both looked at each other and ran towards the voices. It was our family members. It turned out both our families had been out searching for us. We had apparently been missing for hours. They hadn't been able to see us or hear us, even though we had been only a few minutes from the party in a relatively sparse part of the forest. My family had a hunting dog, too, and he had been out searching as well. He went right by us and didn't smell us or hear us at all. When I got older, I did some research trying to figure out what could have happened to us that day. With the mushroom ring and other factors, I believe fairies are the only supernatural creatures able to create what happened to me and my friend that evening. It's an experience I'll never forget. I recently heard an interesting story from my friend that happened to her when she was a little girl. The story is a bit short, but I thought you'd like to hear it anyway. She lived in a big old house in Michigan, just her and her dad. The house was surrounded by a forest, and other houses in the area were few and far between. Whenever she went out to play, she would stay in the yard close to the house and never venture into the forest. For one thing, she wasn't allowed, and for another, it gave her the creeps. One day, as she played in the yard, she started to get a weird feeling, like she was being watched. She looked towards the forest, but didn't see anyone there. So eventually, she went inside and forgot about it. That night, she had a dream that she was in the forest. She was out there between the trees, lying in a tuft of grass when she saw something move out of the corner of her eye. She looked up quickly and saw a creature that appeared to be a pixie. 
The pixie was about five inches tall and wore rustic green clothing and a red hat. She looked at it, and it looked at her, and then it raised a bow and shot an arrow at her. The arrow hit her right in the arm. The next morning, she woke up thinking it was all a bad dream. But then she noticed a cut on her arm, right where the arrow had hit her. That cut later became a scar that she still has now, 30 years later. She says remembering the incident today, she is struck by how real it felt. The scar is certainly real, though she can't explain it. At the time of this incident, I worked as a SAR for a crew fighting wildfires in the Alaskan interior forests. It was our job to cut a line around an entire fire to eliminate any chance of it drying up and spreading. It was a low adrenaline, regular, run-of-the-mill day at work, slow and steady. My SAW partner and I would each run a SAW till the tank ran out and switch tasks. One would act as SAR and the other as Swamper cutting an 8-10 to foot control line on top of this rocky ridge. Soon it began to rain a bit, and for the most part the fire was controlled, though still not contained. It was my turn to saw, while he swapped the trees. I started cutting a group of young poplars about 2-3 to inches wide and 10-15 to feet tall. But as I went to cut into the bottom of one of them, right before my eyes, the tree vanished and a not-so-handsome little man appeared standing there. He was about a foot tall, bald, kind of dirty, with a beard and many wrinkles on his face. He stared up at me and screamed, No! I was shocked, but somehow my hands managed to stay steady on the saw that vibrated from the 450cc motor. My partner later said that even through the screen's protective lenses, he could tell something was amiss. He yelled my name. I didn't reply. I was just standing there, stiff. Then my partner, a seasoned veteran and paramedic, shut off the saw, walked over, and asked me what happened. I still didn't reply. I must have been white as a sheet. He grabbed me by my shoulders and had me sit down. For 15 minutes, he tried to get me to tell him what had happened. But how could I tell this man who trusted me with his life what I had seen? Finally, he said he would have to call our crew supervisor, and I turned to him and said, I saw an elf. He looked at me and nodded as if he wasn't surprised. I said, you saw it too? He said no, but others on the crew had seen them. We went back to work after that, and I didn't mention it again. The others on the crew weren't ready to share their experiences either, for fear of the fallout that might occur. But now, being a 39-year-old man that has retired from a job that most people considered brave, tough, and masculine, I love sharing this story. Most people say, well, it got me thinking anyway about what could be out there. Around 2010, I visited a state park with a large forested area known to have fairy activity. Unfortunately, a recent fire had destroyed a section of the forest, and I had decided to visit and make an offering, hoping that the fire hadn't harmed or disturbed whatever's out there. It was early afternoon, and I was on my own walking along a path that leads towards the area that had been most affected by the fire. But as the burned-out area came into view, I felt a chill, and all the sounds of the forest suddenly went silent. I could no longer hear birds or insects or even the wind. I stopped, trying to figure out what was going on. Then I saw something. A 
female being standing in the burnt out area between the blackened trees. She was as tall as an average human woman with long brown hair, dressed all in white. She had a youthful look, healthy, and an intense stare. She was looking right at me. I stood very still and we watched each other for a few minutes. And then she just disappeared. I was shocked to say the least, but thinking back, there's no doubt in my mind that she was a fairy. I don't know why she showed herself to me that day. I don't think she meant me any harm, but I do think she was upset about the fire. Every once in a while, I go back and leave offerings, but I haven't seen her again since. This happened in the 1980s in Louisiana. Two close friends and I had gone on a camping trip. We were on private property, over a hundred acres of land, which was mostly forested. We found a good spot deep in the woods and lit a campfire. The moon was waxing towards full, casting a silver light on the trees. As we sat by the fire, the wind started rustling the trees, but not the brush and we saw what we thought were fireflies in the tall grass. This was strange because it was not the season for fireflies and too cold. Curious as to what these things were, we followed them into the deeper forest. The lights would get brighter periodically as we followed and then dim again, as if they were purposely enticing us forward. One of my friends did mention will-o'-the-wisps, but we kept trying to convince ourselves that they were just bugs. Soon, the moon began to dim, and we decided to turn back. As we neared our campsite, we saw small, glowing things on our bedrolls. They were about three and a half to four inches tall, with wings that either caught the moonlight with amazingly effective, multifaceted reflections, or they were bioluminescent. Legs were visible, but barely, and they seemed to be communicating with each other. We heard sounds, not cicada calls, as it wasn't their spawning season, but more of a thrum. It seemed like they were talking. As we reached the edge of the clearing, they all flew away into the tall grass. Out of either superstition or manners, we took some of our food, plus a few sweets, and placed them a few feet into the tall grass. During the night, we could see dim lights dancing between the grass stalks. In the morning, we checked the food we had left, and only the sweets were gone. In South Louisiana, where we were, there are very few bioluminescent insects, and none of the ones we looked up matched what we saw that night. We did not know this prior, but the landowner, when asked if he ever saw strange lightning bugs, did mention fairies. After researching what we witnessed and eliminating other explanations, we all decided that fairies fit the description of what we saw the best. I can't say I was frightened when I saw the lights, but whatever was drawing us deeper into the woods felt different than the things we saw in our bedrolls. And it makes me wonder what might have happened if we had continued to follow them. I can't remember the specific date this occurred, but I can recall that it was during the summer of 2009. I was 10 years old and was spending the summer at my grandparents' house, as I often did during my childhood. I was with my cousin Clara, who was 10, and my sister Mia, who was 13. My grandparents had this mansion-like house that sits atop a hill with other mansion-like houses that are far behind it but you wouldn't be able to tell since the tall grass and trees and stuff would sometimes cover your view. I was excited to spend time with my cousin. Me and Clara never had a dull moment when we were together. She would always make me laugh and vice versa. 
I didn't mind being the only boy other than my grandpa in the house because we had so much fun. One afternoon, on a beautiful sunny day, Claire and I were playing out in the backyard while Mia supervised, since she was the oldest. My grandparents had this huge yard surrounded by trees. At the end of the yard, a narrow grassy path led to a large forest. None of us had actually been too far down the path to the forest, and on that day we thought it could be fun to finally see what was out there. We followed the path to a wide clearing. It was beautiful. There was a meadow filled with wildflowers and a river that reflected the sunlight. We were all really taken with the place. Mia suggested we have a scavenger hunt to look around and find the most interesting leaves, flowers, or stones that the forest had to offer. So we split up. Clara and I went in one direction and Mia in the other. Before we separated, which in retrospect was a stupid idea, Mia said we should meet back at the clearing in about half an hour. But after only about 15 minutes, with my pockets filled with stones or pebbles I thought were cool looking, we returned to the meadow. But as we neared it, I noticed a cabin up ahead, right in the middle of the meadow. Next to the cabin was a tree I can only describe as wicked. It was old and twisted and had lumps and shapes in the bark. I was confused. We had spent a lot of time in that meadow exploring. How had I not noticed this cabin before? Clara soon came up behind me and she saw the cabin too. Where did that come from? She asked. I said I didn't know. We were both sure there had been no cabin there before, no wicked tree. We were both bewildered. We might have been only ten, but we both knew for a fact that cabins didn't just appear out of nowhere, and the same went for wicked trees. Clara said she was scared and asked if we could go find Mia. The moment she mentioned Mia's name, we heard giggles from somewhere near the cabin. We thought Mia might be messing with us and ran over to see if it was her. But as we neared the porch of the creepy cabin, the door creaked open by itself. Again, we thought it might be Mia, so we approached the cabin hesitantly to have a look inside. As we both entered the cabin just a few paces, we were bombarded by the smell of smoke and what seemed to me like rotting flesh. The both of us pulled our shirts over our noses. It was dim, the only light was from the open door and one small window right across from it, like directly across from it. You could see dust floating around in the sunbeam. Neither of us could take the smell, so we immediately decided to leave. But as we were walking out, I heard singing from what I presumed to be downstairs. I heard one particular voice, then another, then another, three in total coming from the floor directly below. I told Clara to wait by the door. She was getting really afraid. I could see tears starting to form in her eyes. Clara, I just want to see if Mia is down there. If she's not, I'll come right back, okay? I said. There was a steep staircase not far from the entrance. I hurried down as quietly as I could. The stairs led to a narrow cement hallway and a door with a small window on it. I looked through the window and what I saw terrifies me to this day. It was what looked like a cult. I saw three figures dancing around in a circle, chanting in some foreign language I couldn't understand. The room was dim, and I couldn't make out many details, but I could see what they were wearing. Dark, gown-like clothing. They were somewhat tall, and were all wearing tall, pointy hats like you would imagine a witch wearing. I was on the verge of panicking. I mean, it seemed like something straight out of a horror film. I felt sick. Then I felt somebody tap me on the shoulder. I tried not to gasp too hard and spun around to find Mia and Clara behind me, both looking terrified. I whispered angrily, What are you guys doing here? But before either of them could answer, the door behind me blew open and I felt a sharp blast of wind. We all ran, up the stairs, out of the cabin, just out of there. We were definitely being followed. 
I could hear footsteps chasing us. I looked back, and when I did, I saw one of their faces. The face of a pale white goblin thing, or whatever, with black holes for eyes and liquid pouring out of them. Black liquid. It had a huge crooked nose, and its grin was evil, and it had black teeth with black liquid streaming down its pointy chin. It was the most chilling thing I've ever seen. I screamed in horror. The sun was about setting at this time. It was getting dark, and we were being chased out of the woods by these ugly beings. The noises they made sounded harsh and gross. They definitely weren't human. We made it to the narrow path leading back to my grandparents' yard and raced across it to the house. Thankfully, my grandma hadn't locked the back door. It wasn't until then, when we were inside, that we stopped hearing the footsteps and the noises of pursuit. We looked back out the window and didn't see anything, and we all collapsed on the floor. My grandma came rushing in and asked what was happening. She looked completely frightened. We all took turns explaining what had happened to us, and Clara and I got to hear Mia's side of the story. Mia said that not long after we had separated, she had heard cackling and singing in the woods. She had assumed Claire and I were playing a prank on her and went to tell us to knock it off. That's when she noticed the cabin. She felt too frightened to go near it and instead stayed hidden, waiting for me and Clara to come back. Eventually, she saw us run up to the cabin and go inside. She had wanted to scream but couldn't find her voice. She crept up to the cabin and found Clara, who told her I had gone into the basement. And then she and Clara had come down to get me. After I told my part of the story, my grandma's face became blank. She said whatever had chased us was probably a bear and that we shouldn't go into the woods again. The three of us looked at each other in confusion. It was most certainly not a bear that we saw. But... We were too tired and freaked out to really argue. Not long after was the end of the vacation, and I had to go back to school. As terrifying as the experience was, I gotta say, me and my sister Mia were never really close before, and I'm kind of grateful that this experience happened, as weird as it sounds, because it brought all of us closer together. The three of us, Clara, Mia, and I, have all kept this experience between us three. Until now, that is. We were young at the time, but we all agreed that it happened. We know what we saw, and it wasn't a bear, and definitely not any kind of animal. I'm sure it was the Fae, or whatever exists out there, hidden in the forests of the world. Thanks for watching. Those stories came courtesy of subscribers and the Fairy Census by the Fairy Investigation Society. Thanks to everyone who submitted their stories. Let me know which one was your favorite down in the comments and why you like it best. Also, you might have noticed some of my videos lately have had themes. This one was all encounters that happened in a forest, and I did another one with childhood fairy encounters and fairies in the family. But let me know in the comments if you have any ideas or requests for a particular theme that you'd like to see. And I'll see if I can find enough stories to match it for a future video. I'm also still sharing your fairy art on my social media channels. So if you're an artist and have something to share, please email it to me with fairy art in the subject line. Some of these stories from the census were edited just to make them more friendly for narr narration but if you want to read the originals, the link to the census is in the description. As always, extra special thanks goes out to all my supporters on Patreon. I really appreciate you guys so much. Just the fact that you take the time to give some of your hard-earned money to support this channel just means the world to me, and it's just such an encouragement to keep doing the work that I do. So uh, I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. If you like this content and you'd like to support it on Patreon, please check out my Patreon page. The link is in the description. Don't forget to comment below, like, share, and subscribe if you're new, and be sure to hit the bell to receive notifications. Until next time, this has been a visit 
from your scary fairy godmother.